Today is September 11th, 2007. I'm Judy Menger at the Warhawk Air Museum in Nampa, Idaho. Today I will be interviewing Francis Tommy Thompson for our Veterans History Project in partnership with the Library of Congress. Our camera operator today is Jan Peterson. Welcome, Tommy. Well, thank you. Would you please state your full name? My name is Francis Lester Thompson. And what's your current address? 2719 North Aaron Mink Lane, Meridian, Idaho. And your birth date? October 30, 1916. And what was your branch of service? Branch of Navy in, in the U.S. Navy. And the years that you served in the Navy? Uh, October 1936 to October 1957. We thank you for coming to tell your story today. We look forward to hearing it. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Tommy, why don't you tell me about uh, your childhood, your early years in school. Where were you born? I was born in Medicine Lodge, Kansas. And in case you can't find it on the map, it's 100 miles southwest of Wichita. And were you, it was, were you born in a town or out on? I was on? born in a town, oh, Okay. Yes. What did your dad do? My dad worked as a clerk at the grocery store uh, for the first five years of my life. And he decided he wanted to get a better job, so he went to Chicago, went to school up there, electrician, and got a job there. Did your mom work? Uh, later in life, uh, she worked in Marshall Field store in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Did you have any siblings? I had two older brothers. I was the youngest. So you went to, you didn't go to school in, in Medicine Lodge, then you moved well, to? periodically I did. Okay. Because uh, uh, I wasn't happy in Chicago. I just wanted to go back where I came from. So my grandparents lived in Medicine Lodge, so I spent some time back with them, living with them, going to school. Then I go back to Chicago again. And so how long did you do this, to high school? Uh, I was back and forth to medicine lodge to elementary school, and then I went to Chicago for high school all the way. So you graduated from high school in, in, Chicago. in Chicago. What did you do after you graduated? I went to back to Kansas, got a summer job, made a little money, went to uh, school in Oklahoma, college in Oklahoma, for two years. And the Depression caught up, but couldn't get enough money to go back for the third year, so I joined the Navy. And where did you sign up? 1936, October. And and where was that? In Chicago. In Chicago. Mm -hmm. So where did they send you for basic training? I went for recruit training in Norfolk, Virginia, and from there I went to Washington D.C. the United States Navy School of Music. Okay. And what were you uh, studying there? Uh, the two years of uh, musical studies, history, theory. Uh, the whole story, story of music and my instruments. And what instruments did you and play? The trumpet and guitar. Well, we've got a uh, diploma here we'd like to put into the... Uh, this is the diploma from the uh, school. And you graduated in 1938. 1938, yes. And what rank were you then? I was a uh, musician first class when I graduated. Where did they send you from there? I went to the USS Saratoga. Out of? Every aircraft carrier in Long Beach, California. We went as a unit, the whole band graduated at the same time and transferred as a unit. Oh, okay. So what was your first uh, that port? First ship was uh, Saratoga. Uh, we were the Admiral's band. He was a, uh, his command was a aircraft carrier battle force. And we were stationed in Long Beach. And uh, Admiral King was our uh, Admiral. He transferred his flag to the Lexington uh, three months later, so you make a trip to the East Coast for battle maneuvers. And the Saratoga was going to go to the Navy Yard and not make that maneuvers. So I got transferred to the Lexington then. That was my second ship. 
And that was uh, por uh, birthed where? Birth, still in uh, Long Beach, California. So how long did you stay uh, in Long Beach? Well, we stayed there, and periodically operated out of there, came back in, and then the fleet went to the East Coast in 1939 for maneuvers, to have battle maneuvers on the East Coast. So at Lexington, we went to, through the canal to the East Coast, had battle maneuvers over there, then we went up to Norfolk, and we were going to go to the New York World's Fair in, Norfolk, in New York City. But uh, the word around that uh, Hitler didn't like the idea of the whole United States Navy on the East Coast right then. So we went back to the West Coast, the Pacific Fleet went back to the West Coast, did not go to New York. And we were on the West Coast then when uh, Germany invaded Poland in September 1939. Now, were you strictly uh, assigned to the band? Did you have any other duties on the ship? Well, that was my primary duty. We had, during battle, we had other duties, but only the normal duties during the day. And all, all sailors naturally have cleaning duty. So we did that also. But primarily you were a musician you did, in the band. You, and you did your, your practicing and... Practicing and playing. And so after uh, Hitler invaded Poland, what did you, did you move, did your ship move? Well, we, uh, uh, Admiral King got relieved by Admiral Halsey, and Admiral Halsey wanted to go to Yorktown, which is a newer carrier. So we just moved, transferred from the York, uh, Lexington to the Yorktown, and that was home port in San Diego. And that's when I went to the uh, Yorktown in uh, summer 1939. And then you stayed stationed there? Stayed there in Yorktown. How long were you there? Well, we were there oh, most of the time. We went to the Navy Yard in Bremerton for three months, came back down, and then we got deployed to the Hawaiian Islands. We spent uh, several months out there, about 13 months, I guess it was, some periodically. And, and what t and time frame was that? Oh, well, that was 1940 to 41. And in spring of 1941, we were operating out of uh, Pearl Harbor. We went on, got to sea one Sunday with the whole fleet going out for some more exercises and battle maneuvers. Monday morning we looked around and the horizon was empty except for four destroyers and us. No other ships. And the uh, Captain called all hands to quarters. After the regular morning quarters, eight o'clock, he called all hands again at nine o'clock and announced that we had orders to go to the East Coast. And uh, secret orders. We were, nobody was supposed to know where we were going or what we were doing. And that was very evident because I'd, and we were due to go back to San Diego, and I'd arranged for my parents and my grandparents to come to San Diego to meet us there. They got there and we weren't there. <laughs> so they tried to find out and nobody knew where the Yorktown was. Just disappeared. You know, they even they had a friend of ours there that his wife was a member of the Navy Wives Club and even the Navy Wives didn't know where it was. And when they didn't know, it was gone. But we went through the canal at night. So we had a, our name secured or obscured on the back so nobody could see the name. Uh, normally, we had a big Y on the side of our stack to identify us, tell us the difference from the Enterprise. We painted over that Y so they couldn't see that. And we went through the canal and went over to Bermuda and anchored in grassy bottom bay of Bermuda then for a period and rest and get refueled and some supplies again. And then we started the North Atlantic convoy duty. We went up to Arge, uh, Newfoundland, Argentia Bay, and uh, rested there for a while, then went over close to Nova Scotia and picked up a convoy and take the convoy over just off of Ireland. And the British Navy would bring a convoy out of the British Isles, and we would take up their convoy and they'd take ours. And we took theirs back to Nova Scotia and they took ours on end. Great Britain. We did that for several months, lots of trips back and forth. Uh, and when we 
the big convoy back would go back to Argentia, Newfoundland again to get refueled supplies. That was ships going up there to refuel us. And, and our, we were due for a Navy Yard overhaul that winter, so uh, last of November, we left uh, New England, went over to Portland, Maine for a few days, then sailed down to Norfolk. We pulled into Norfolk on a, a Friday, tied to Pier 7 Naval Operating Base, and we were sitting there Sunday, December 7th, 1941. We hadn't made it to the Navy Yard yet. But they uh, decided to take us over to the Navy Yard. We went over to the Navy Yard Tuesday, went in dry dock immediately, scraped the bottom, repainted it, put some extra sponsons on the catwalk around the flight deck for machine gun mounts and uh, 20 millimeters, which we had no 20 millimeters, just 50 calibers, and the 8 inch guns. And they put a bunch of sponsons on there, and then we left the Navy Yard, and our ship fitters finished all the work that the Navy Yard had started because we were on our way to the West Coast. Now, uh, uh, where were you when, when you got word that Pearl Harbor had been bombed? I was down in my compartment uh, Sunday, day of rest. I was in my bunk taking. What was the reaction on the ship? Do you remember? Uh, well, we better go ashore because we're going to get no any liver for quite a while now. So we got dressed, cleaned up. Three of us went over to Norfolk, rented a hotel room, and spent the Sunday in a hotel room talking. And uh, Monday morning we went back to the ship. And then that was a good thing we did because that was our last liberty in Norfolk. And we went, got underway out of the Navy Yard because we worked in the Navy Yard when we was there. We was loading up, getting everything done. 24 hours a day getting mm -hmm. work done. And we started in for the West Coast. So you knew you were headed for battle then? Oh, we yeah. were going to go to the West Coast. And we went through the canal, and uh, instead of going to San Diego, which we normally went out of home port, we went down to the Solomon Gilbert Islands and uh, made a raid on a couple of islands there. And where, so after uh, you got word that you were going to go back over to the West Coast, you went through the canal, right? And instead of going to San Diego, you headed west, uh, right? Okay. And you would you like to show us where you went. Uh, we came down to the Marshall and Gilbert Islands here, and the Enterprise came over, and we combined with them to raid those two sets of island groups, sent our planes in there because the Japanese had taken those islands. And then we went back to Pearl Harbor. I guess that was quite a sight. Oh, it was, yeah. yeah. Can you describe what you felt when you saw well, it? Well, it, it was sad. Mm -hmm. Because that was only a couple, what, a month or so after oh, that happened? Well, it was still January. Uh-huh. We left, we left San Diego right after New Year's, and so it was about the second week in January, I guess, when it was in there. It looked completely different than it had uh, when you had been there. Much yeah. different, yeah. yeah we'd been over uh, where Utah uh, was uh, bombed and hit and turned upside down. We were, that's where we used to birth all the time, when we was there. So you so you spent how long in in Honolulu again? Well, we went back to Honolulu then and uh, spent about a week there, and getting uh, outfitted again, and replenished. Then we took off, came back to the Coral Sea, and that's down here, just between uh, Australia, Solomon Islands, and New Guinea, that whole area. And we spent. Uh, well, we were there the latter part of January. We spent then February and March and April, and in May uh, we got in the Battle of Coral Sea. The Japanese had uh, decided they wanted to move down to Port Moresby to take it, so they have a jumping-off place to take Australia. Mm -hmm. And 
Our duty was to prevent them from getting a foothold in New Guinea and Port Moresby. So we had a battle right there. The Japanese lost a couple of carriers, we lost Lexington there. And Yorktown had three bomb hits in there. So did you have to go to uh, a port to Well, we wanted, we wanted to check for damage, and uh, so we asked for Brisbane, Australia to go in there. That was very close. It's right down here. Ask to go in there, but MacArthur said, well, you'll be a big target for the Japanese to come in here, so we'll go somewhere else. So we went to Tonga. Tonga. There's a British island down here. And we'd been there once before during our, our cruises around the Solomon, the Coral Sea for a little recreation. We had spent four days in there and had liberty of sort of nowhere to go. Uh. <laughs> Just have your feet on the ground instead of being down the water. But it was something, it was a break. And then we got uh, in the Battle of Coral Sea, got a damage there, and then Nimitz called us back to Pearl Harbor. And we stopped at Tonga and sent some divers over to check the bottom to see if we, how much damage we had, because mm -hmm. we were looking a little oil. So we were back in the Pearl Harbor, went to dry dock there, got some patches put on the side, got uh, some of the interior damage just cleaned out, didn't do any patching inside because mm -hmm. we had those bombs there and it tore it up. So we took all the loose metal, tore it out, threw it away. We spent 24 hours a day working in the dry dock there, getting uh, repairs, loading ammunition, loading supplies. And uh, I got underway again about four days later out of Pearl Harbor. And that's when we went to Midway. And Nimitz, Admiral Nimitz sent a message to the ship. He, he knew we had some damage and that we were uh, in need of repairs. He said, but you're going out that one more battle and then you're going back to States. It won't be just for a month or two. You'll get a full overhaul this time. Well, we never made it. So you got down to Midway. What happened? Well, we got to Midway and the Enterprise Hornet we were a task force, and we had our own task force, the Yorktown did. Yeah, but we were close enough to the Enterprise Hornet that we knew they were there. Couldn't see them, they couldn't see us. In the Midway area, circling around there, and uh, we knew the Japanese were coming because we had code breakers on the island, the Hawaiian Islands had broken their code. And we knew they were coming, and so out there somewhere, so we sent our scout planes out every day to look around and find them. They had PBYs flying from Pearl Harbor, PBYs flying from Wake. Now what anyway, is a, what's a PBY? It's a float, um, amphibious plane, a patrol plane, okay. patrol bomber. And uh, we used to call it the, uh, the Goonie Bird. And this is the way it flew. <laughs> Funny. Okay, the Goonie Birds. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. But that, uh, so we started searching then to try to find Japanese fleet. They, they finally, a couple of days later, they found it. We sent, sent our raids in and attacked their ships. And they then knew that we were there. <coughs> in the air, so they started searching for us and they found us. They did not find the Enterprise and Hornet, though. We were the only ones they found. Hmm. So we were the, at the brunt of the, their attack. We had all the other planes on us. And we got hit again, bomb hit, two torpedo hits. And the two torpedoes were close together and a lot of damage up in that area. They put the um, fires out in the engine room, one bomb went down the stack and all the way down in the fire rooms but the fire's out, we, so we lost power. We were sitting still in the water. That's from the bomb labs, and uh, the crews went to work, got the fires going back again, got the ship underway, and we were moving very slowly, about 18, 20 knots, when the torpedo planes came in and hit the two torpedoes. 
and that put us dead in the water again. And then we started listing, and getting a serious list, it's hard to, hard to walk on the ship, getting hard to walk upright. As you get the slight, slight little thing while you slip and fall and hang on to something, just stand up again. So the captain, the admiral, they surveyed the situation, so they decided to abandon the ship. And that's when they left. And so you abandoned ship. Were there other ships there to pick oh, up? Oh yes, there were ships in the area. We had, we had destroyers uh, and our escort and a cruiser that were with us all the time. That was part of our task force. So the destroyers, but we had life rafts on the ship. But the, the life rafts were full by the time the people from down the lower decks got up on top side to get off, and so we had no room for them. So they hang on the ropes on the side of the life raft. Each life raft had a rope around it, and it room for a lot of people to hang on those ropes. And that's where I was. When I, you were hanging on a rope? Because my battle station was down on the third deck. It took me a while to get up there. And so I went over, off, over the side on the fantail, and down the rope there, and swam out to a uh, life raft and grabbed hold of the rope on it. And we were swimming around there and getting away from the ship, when the destroyers that were working in picking up the survivors, uh, we got the word that another raid was coming in. Mm -hmm. So they saw the general quarters and left us. And uh, went away and they came come back and said, well, they found that those were our planes returning from our raid. There wasn't a Japanese plane. So they, they came back in and continued picking us up, finally got us. How long do you think you were in the water? Oh, it's hard to tell, but I'd say two or three hours, maybe. It's hard to judge that. All I know is my watch stopped at two o'clock in the afternoon on the side that was wet. And so where did they take you from when they picked you up? I got picked up by a destroyer, USS Benham. And uh, I spent the night on there, and they had torpedo tubes on the main deck, those destroyers that time, and I spent my night sleeping underneath the torpedo tubes. And it goes, our crew of uh, maybe a couple hundred on the destroyer, and there were 300, 400 of us survivors on there. So just no room for us down below. Mm -hmm. And uh, we spent the night there, then the next day, they transferred us to the uh, Portland heavy cruiser. That was a part of our task force, so they had more room. So they slugged lines across and went beach each boy, and we had pulled over by Beaches Boys. They spent uh, two nights on the Portland, and then they sent a subtender out from Pearl Harbor to get us. And we had transferred back from the Portland back to the subtender on the Fulton. And we all got on the Fulton, and the Fulton took us back to Pearl Harbor. And that was an experience then, because they wanted us out of the way so they sent a good bit of us up to a marine camp up in the mountain, mountains in Pearl, in Honolulu, in Hawaiian Island, Oahu, the main island of Oahu. Why did they want you out of the way? Well, they didn't, didn't want uh, the word getting around and oh. had a bunch of survivors there. So they wanted us out, out of the way where they could isolate us. And I don't know whether you ever heard of Carlson's Raiders back in World War II, but they were the a bunch of Marines that were training that was going to make raids on islands, landings, to sneak in and cause damage and sneak out again. And that's where they were, up in the hills there, training, and they put us in their camp. And uh, we had some interesting experiences with those guys. Uh, a couple of our people on our crew had, uh, found a jeep up there one day and they found it Phil Stewart went for a ride in it. Come to find out later, it was Jimmy Roosevelt's Jeep, President Roosevelt's son, that they'd stolen. <laughs> but they didn't get anything for that. But we, we spent a week, two weeks up there with those Marines, and uh, watching them do their bit, uh, which I didn't envy them a bit for what they was going to do. Then they sent us back into Pearl Harbor then, the receiving station. We spent some time there. But we had work details. 
they didn't want it sitting around, so that they were just uh, starting at the uh, cemetery up the Punch Bowl, the National Cemetery. So we were up there on grave digging details, just to keep us busy and keep us doing something during the day. And then the the band was still as a unit. We had lost two people in the torpedoes mm -hmm. runs. Yeah, but they kept the rest of us together and uh, they transferred us as a unit. We went back to the States on a transport, USS Henderson. We went back to San, uh, San Francisco, the per, mer, Treasure Island, the, the receiving station, waiting for further assignment. And spent a couple of months there, got leave, and uh, finally got orders to Miami, Florida. And we were selling war bonds. We were going to be on display down there. So we covered the state of Florida, went to Jacksonville, Tampa, Key West, all over playing, uh, playing dances. We, we had spent the rest of the war, though, stationed in Miami. And we'd play regular every week in uh, Hollywood, Florida, and Fort Lauderdale, Florida, also in Miami, Florida at the USO clubs and the, uh, the churches, the schools, just to publicity. Mm -hmm. and that's how we finished the war. And what rank were you? I, I, was, I was the first musician then, as a first class petty officer. I got that in uh, May of 1941. Yeah, but, uh, there wasn't any chance for advancement in the music, musical benches because there was 20 people in the band and one bandmaster. And you had to wait for the bandmaster to retire or die for somebody else to make bandmaster, make chief. And that was it. You were first class, period. So what did, what did you think you would do after the war? Well, I, my enlistment didn't run out till October 1946. So I, uh, got stationed on the USS Tarawa and made the cruise on it and it came back and I, my enlistment was then getting close to ex expiration. They asked me if I was going to ship over. I said, not on board here. I don't, they said, well, well, we're going to the West Coast, then go to the Western Pacific. So we'll send you somewhere else in the meantime. So I went to USS Midway. It was in the Navy Yard over in Portsmouth, Virginia. I spent a couple months there until my enlistment ran out, and I re-enlisted with the option of changing my rate to electronics technician, and had to go to electronics technician school for it. So I took my discharge, I had terminal leave, I had 90 days terminal leave. I could not really re-enlist until my terminal leave expired. Hmm. So if I was married that time, my wife and I uh, went down to uh, Miami where she'd come from. And the time there in time to re-enlist, I, I, on my way to Chicago back to see my folks. And my wife was pregnant and went to Hagerstown, Maryland to see another guy that had been in the band with me. This is him while I was there, my wife started going in labor. So my daughter was born in Hagerstown. And then we left there, started driving back to Chicago. And uh, when the time came for my terminal leave to expire, why well, I, I got on the bus, went down to Jacksonville to the main recruiting station for the Florida area to re-enlist. And I got, got back in and they sent me to electronics training in Great Lakes. That's why I left my wife and daughter there. Mm -hmm. My folks lived in Chicago then, it was right next to it. So they made you actually get out of the service and then re-enlist? I had to re-enlist that, get out and re-enlist to, to go into the jobs, place. okay. Mm -hmm. That was the requirements at that time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I re-enlisted, still, I had to go back to second class, I would do it, to get one reduction in rate mm -hmm. to go to school. So I went to electronics technician school, the first six months, Basic training, I graduated from that, and a certain top percentage of the class always got 
advancement rating after you graduated. So I made first class right away again. Then I went through the uh, secondary specialized training in Great Lakes. Finished that and got assigned to Annapolis, Maryland, the Naval Academy, as an instructor. And there I had a good tour of duty, uh, 18 months there as an instructor. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I got transferred to, I made chief then while I was there. Got transferred to Argentia Naval Station, Argentia, Newfoundland again. And it was under construction when the ship was there during 1941. We had a very interesting experience that time too. I'll go back a little bit. Uh, the band went over to play uh, for the construction people before their movies one night. And the, so the storm came up while we were there and they couldn't put the boats in the water to take us, come back and get us. And the ship had to get underway to keep being blown up because of dragging the anchor. The wind was strong in there. So we had to spend the night ashore. And they had a barracks ship there for the workers. We spent the night in their barracks ship. And they went back to the ship the next day when the storm subsided and said boats didn't get us. And the executive officer met us on the gangway and had a strip naked all of our clothes were down the laundry for fumigation, and we went to the sick bay for decontamination. Because that they said that barrack ship was infested with bed bugs, <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't, they didn't want to bring it brought back to the ship. But anyway, after uh, go back to where I was before. Did your family go with you to Newfoundland? Well, I went up there first by myself because I had to find a place. I couldn't. There was no room in the base for base housing. So I had to find a place off in the economy uh, to, get to find or to rent, and then get the base uh, housing officer's approval that that was suitable. So it took a couple of months before I found a place, and I got it, and then I got permission for my family to go, and I, I flew back to the States and bumped a ride on planes, hitchhiking on planes down to Miami to get them where they were at her firm parents. And uh, I'd come back I'd, earlier, I'd take, come back and set my car in Newfoundland. So it was already there. But I flew back with them that night and brought them up. And they got in the car, drove out to the house, that I'd, the place where I'd rented. My wife went and looked at it, and she says, I'm not staying a night here. Because it was about 10 miles from the nearest neighbor. It was an old Quonset hut. Had a, a gasoline-driven generator out in another room, out in another house for electricity. The only heat was a fireplace. In Newfoundland, that was winter coming up then. This was October. She said, I'm not spending here, so I, uh, a friend of mine, chief, another chief there on the base, I, he rented a place, and his family wasn't coming up for another couple of months. I said, hey, could I just put my family in your place while you're, until your family gets here? He said, sure. So I uh, went to his place, stayed there for a month, and in the meantime, I found another house. And this one was in town, in the little town of Argentia. And uh, there were three other families living there at the time, and the fourth one just moved out, and I moved in with them. And it was very interesting. I had four rooms downstairs and they converted each one to a kitchen. And four rooms upstairs and each one was a bedroom. So you had a kitchen downstairs, a bedroom upstairs, every family. And you had a little oil stove, a converted coal stove in the kitchen for your uh, cooking. And, uh, some of them had put uh, oil burners in, some hadn't. The one I had rented, we had no rubber in it. But the uh, heat came from a central stove downstairs, which was a coal burner, and kept the coal outside. And the, uh, 
breathe in every night, bank the fire, come down in the morning, break the coals up, hope there's some red coals on the bottom and start another fire in a hurry because it got cold in that house. The, uh, we were about 100 yards from the road, the downtown area, sitting right on the beach, this house we rented. And the had a strong wind came in, uh, it was a high tide and blew the water flooded the uh, whole area between us and the street, the downtown area, and it froze our water line up. So we didn't have water in the house. And we had a local man, Newfoundlander, and we hired him to haul, call, haul water up the house every morning, fill up that big wash tub we had in the kitchen with water. He'd go back and forth the buckets, two buckets at a time, to fill that tub up. How long did that last? That was all, all winter long. All winter long. Until the thought out. We, we got a welding machine, borrowed a welding machine from the Bray base, drove it out there. It's about a 20 mile drive by road. But if you took a little boat across the stretch of water there, it's about three miles. So I had to drive that welding machine out there, hook it up to the line, and turn it on and thaw that line out. Turned the water on before it got back to the house, it was frozen again. So we just gave up on it finally. So how long were you in Newfoundland? Those are two years. And, and then where they said? We got, finally got to a, a base assignment. Then I got assigned to a destroyer tender. Uh, it was under being uh, recommissioned in wartime and then put it in fleet re reserve fleet. And it's putting it back in service again in, in Charleston, South Carolina. So we went to Charleston and uh, went warmer to work down there. Oh, yeah. Uh, went to work on that thing, and when I got ready to go back in commission again, I was going to Horn Port, it was going to be Narragansett Bay in Newport, Rhode Island. So my wife and my daughter got in a car, and she was, uh, daughter was just getting ready to go to first grade. They uh, drove up to uh, Newport, found a place to live, and I stayed in Charleston because I had to ride the ship up. They found an apartment, got located, and I drove the, rode the ship up there. And uh, while I was on there, I got appointed a warrant officer. So I had to be reassigned because they didn't have a bill for a warrant officer on there. I was reassigned to a sub uh, reserve fleet group in Astoria, Oregon. Spent two years out in Astoria in the reserve fleet. I was electronics and navigation officer of subgroup one. And the executive officer we had when I first went there, he got relieved. And his relief was a ex chief ship fitter from Yorktown from me. He made lieutenant commander then. He was my executive officer. And so we got along pretty good mm -hmm. with him. And my wife was very involved with the girls, uh, Girl Scouts or Brownies. She was a Brownie leader, and the captain of the base, his daughter was a Brownie. So we got associated there. And I spent two years there, two very good years. Mm -hmm. And and then I uh, applied for and received approval to go to a guided missile school in Pomona, California at the Convair plant factory, the factory school. So I got transferred and went down to Pomona, got a house, a little house there, went to school for six months, and uh, graduated and was sent assigned for pre-commissioning pre detail for the USS Boston. Okay, we have a picture of that too. The uh -huh. mm. I have on the Boston. Mm -hmm. And what was unique about the Boston? That was the world's first guided missile cruiser. The capital ship, fighting ship. They had some guided missile ships first for research and development. But the first one for the prime ship, the fighting ship, was the Boston. CAG-1. And where did you go on that? Uh, the Boston was in uh, uh, Camden, New Jersey, 
being put back in commission. So in the interim time, before I was ready, I graduated from school. I went to China Lake, California, with Naval Ordnance Test Station there, uh, for several months while I was waiting for the Boston go. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was up there five months. It was very interesting duty. Uh, right close to Death Valley, we'd go over to Death Valley on weekend trips. Uh, we'd go out and get permission to go on a missile range. I'd yeah, get permission, permission from the missile range officer to go out there on Sunday, because they wouldn't do any firings on Sunday, and you could go out there and look around. And they had some old abandoned gold mines there. That when the Navy took it over, the miners just walked off and left everything there. They had it left the cars. The old Lincoln Continental had been back in, they cut off and made a pickup out of it, sitting out there. And we'd go run around those mines. We got rock hunting then, uh, interested in that. Then, then when the Boston got ready, I, that summer, I, we packed up and went to uh, New Jersey, where it was in Camden, New Jersey, ship, New York Shipbuilding Company was doing a conversion job. And we spent a couple of months there on board one commission. We went across the river to Philadelphia to get commissioned in the Navy area. And the Boston then got signed, got commissioned, made a shakedown. The Builders Trials did those, and they got uh, the uh, commission in the shakedown crews, and our home port was assigned as Norfolk, so moved my family down to Norfolk. Norfolk. And we went in a shakedown and came back from there, and we spent a little time in Norfolk. Then we had a sent to the Mediterranean for six months. And we spent six months cruising the Mediterranean. Uh, and Naples, Italy was our home port there. And we went to visit Valencia, Spain while I was there, uh, Genoa, Italy, uh, Beirut, Lebanon. We were the first ship in the uh, that era to go into uh, Lebanon after the turmoil there. This was before the Marines, though. This was back in 1955, 56. And I uh, spent two years on the Boston, and we came back to Norfolk. And I do for sure duty, but uh, got to talk to the detail officer in Washington. Didn't have any place for me yet, but where do you want to go? I said, well, I'll go back to the West Coast. He said, okay, so I, I've got a bill open on the Norton Sound. And I said, what's the Norton Sound? That's a, he said, that's a guided missile research and development ship out of Port Wanimi. Okay. And I went to transfer the end across country from Norfolk to California and moved our families. Got in a ship, and uh, it was right then working on the Talos missiles. And the next generation of Terrier missiles was coming up, and that's what I was assigned for, but they're not ready yet. So I found myself nothing to do on that ship, so I decided to retire. That's when I put my application in the second half to retire from the Navy. And that was in 1956. That was 1957. 57. Yeah. So where, so you, so where yeah. were you going to go from there? Well, I, had you thought about it? Well, I was on the Boston. I had a electrician, Warren Electrician, come aboard. He came from uh, Idaho. Uh, he'd been up there as a, he was a submariner, but he made warrant and uh, they'd have billets on submarines for warrant officers, so he went to uh, a service ship, but he's also qualified uh, nuclear. Yeah, that's what he's doing out in Idaho, he's going to nuclear power school. So he told me all about what he's doing out there, and I said, hey, that sounds like a really good idea. You know, all you gotta do is write Westinghouse and tell them what you've been doing and who you are, they'll hire you. So I wrote Westinghouse when I decided to retire, put an application in, and they, they sent me a letter that said, you know, when you can, come up for an interview. Let us know. That's why I 
got my retirement notice so approved. I came back and said, yeah, I, I can come up now. So I went for an interview. They hired me. And uh, then when I re retired in the Navy, I went right to work for Westinghouse. Up at, at, here in Boise? At, at, yeah, no, out in Idaho Falls, over Arco, at the nuclear uh, test station there. Uh -huh. I spent uh, 11 years there working for them. And uh, they, uh, I finally decided I'd been trained to train the Navy long enough. What I was doing was training the Navy operators, then decided, well, I think I'll go and see if I can get in commercial business. And I went to the manager of the site, a friend of mine that worked with him, for, been there 11 years, I knew him real well, and I said, hey, I want to go back east to Pittsburgh for commercial. Said, What's my chance? He said, you don't have a chance. There's nobody doing it. Now. I said, well, go ahead and put it in anyway, see what happens. Come back a month, month later, he called me up, went over, he said, Tommy, I don't know who you know back there or how you did it, but you've got to transfer. And this was coming up Christmas. And then I left Idaho Falls between Christmas and New Year's. Moving again. <laughs> Moving to Pittsburgh. So now what were you going to do in Pittsburgh? Well, I was going to go in the commercial nuclear power business. Uh -huh. And uh, I was going to be uh, uh, working out of Pittsburgh on the installation of instrumentation on nuclear power plants and testing them and getting them ready to go. And I was going to work for a guy named Sid Kaslik. And uh, so I transferred. I got my family in the car. We had a Jeep then and a dog. Yeah. We uh, moved from Idaho Falls of Pittsburgh, and found a motel. Well, I was looking for a place to live. I re reported in Monday morning to the building there in uh, Monroeville, where the Westinghouse Nuclear Division is. And I walked with the personnel officer, and he said, well, uh, why don't you stand by here for a while? I said, well, I've got some friends here I'll contact now. You don't mind? He, I said, who are you? I said, well, there's uh, Paul Cameron, my ex-boss out there. He, he's here now. He said, oh, well, good, Paul, you go ahead. He's down here, so please told me where to go. So I went down there and Paul Cameron. And I told Paul, I said, hey, Paul, I got a deer in the back of my pickup, my Jeep. It's still frozen. I don't want to put it in a motel. Can I put it in your freezer somewhere? He said, sure. So I, that night I took my deer out of the Jeep back in, still frozen, cold, put it in his freezer. And the next day I was going around and seeing other people I knew there, and Paul said, Bill Hooten wants to see you. I said, okay. I went to Bill, and he, Bill says, hey, Tommy, he says, I've got to go to New York uh, this Thursday. Uh, I'd like to take you with me. You want to go? I said, well, I'm, you have to talk to my boss. He said, I've already talked to you, boss. It's okay. So Thursday morning, we got on the airplane, flew to New York, went to Abasco Engineering offices down the lower part of Manhattan, and the, uh, down by the battery. We had conferences the rest of the day, stayed the night, next day Friday, had more conferences. And uh, on the plane that night, going back to Pittsburgh, Bill says, I want to have somebody in that office back there on the electrical design. They're, they're slow. There's a, we got a plant down in South Carolina we're working on, and they're only one week ahead of construction. If they just slack off one week, we're dead. We have to stop construction on the plant. He says, I want you to go back there to Pittsburgh, at New York, and push those guys for a couple of weeks for me. I said, okay. He says, I'd known Bill for years, too, because when I first went to Idaho, he and Paul and all the other guys were supervisors there at the time, and I worked with them all. And now they're all top managers out of Pittsburgh. So uh, he sent me back to New York Monday morning, fly back to Pittsburgh Friday night, 
And I did that for six weeks. My wife was sitting in a motel in Pittsburgh with a dog, <laughs> big black lab. I finally went to Bill. I said, Bill, that's it. that couple of weeks has just stretched to six now, and I can't. My wife is going to run away if you don't do something about it. He said, Well, do you want to go to South Carolina? I said, For how long? He said, It's permanent. He said, Well, you've got to talk to Sid again. I did. I got his okay already. He said, You want to go? I said, When can I go? He said, You want to go now? This was uh, Friday night. I said, Yeah. He said, Okay, Monday morning you're on your way. That's it. So how long were you in South Carolina? I was down there two years. And then, and then, and that was uh, we finished the plant up. I was, uh, I was not instrument then as a startup. I'd check the plant, do all the testing in the plant when it, after construction is finished. I'd do all the testing and start it up, get it operating, and then turn it over to the owner. We had what they call a turnkey job. Mm -hmm. We'd do all the work, we'd start it up, get it running on the line, and then give it to the customer and let him have it. It's yours. So how long did you do that? And, well, I was there in South Carolina two years, and then there's a plant in California that uh, the manager wanted some help on this startup, so he asked Westinghouse if he had some people, and he said, well, there's three of them down in South Carolina. He said, yeah, I know those three guys. I'll take them. So the three of us went to California then, to Sacramento, on a contract. The Westinghouse did not have the contract to build a plant. We were working for somebody else now. There was uh, another company who was doing a contract, doing a building, and another, and Sacramento Municipal Utility District owned the plant. So we worked for them for two years and got that straightened out and going and got the right way. So then we uh, broke our little group up. Uh, I went to Minnesota. Oh, the one guy went to Minnesota first, and I went to back a couple weeks later. And the third guy, he went to New York. Okay, so we moved you from California to Minnesota. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what were you doing up there? Well, they had a uh, nuclear power plant under construction there. We just started to test it and start it up and get it running. And the uh, other man that went with me, he was there about three months, and they pulled him off for another project uh, because the Westinghouse got a contract with uh, Public Service in New Jersey to build a power plant on a barge, a nuclear plant, and floating it three miles offshore. And the headquarters where they was going to build that was in Jacksonville, Florida. So they pulled him out the job and down there. But uh, they weren't ready for him there, so he went to New York as his interim job. But he started thinking that he needed some help when he got down to Florida. So he went to people involved in New York, in Pittsburgh, and got me transferred. From Minnesota? From Minnesota to Jacksonville, Florida and a floating plant project. And that was 1975, and I spent two years down there, two and a half years back, working on a project. And then the project got too expensive for the, the owner, the utility, the building it. They decided to scrap it. And I already put millions of dollars into it, but the, <laughs> it was getting expensive, so they scrapped it. So I left a bunch of us down in Jacksonville then that had no place to go. But in the meantime, my boss <laughs> had gotten a job as manager of maintenance in Richland, Washington at the Hanford plant. So when I got cut loose down there, I said, sent him a message to say, hey, give me a job. He said, I can use you, Tommy. And he went to Pittsburgh, got me transferred to Hanford. The manager of the instrumentation installation on Hanford job at the uh, Fast Flux facility. And how long were you there? I was there, oh, about 11 months. I decided mm -hmm. to retire. Mm -hmm. 
from Westinghouse. Because I, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, manager of the plant at Sacramento that had hired us on a contract from Westinghouse had quit there. And he was starting up a consulting company in San Diego. So he got my boss up there in Hanford, manager of maintenance, got him to working for him as a vice president, then he wanted me. So they talked me into retiring from Westinghouse and going to work as a consultant then. And how long did you do that? I was there for three years. I went to uh, New Jersey and not uh, Indiana first. And uh, spent uh, time on the Ohio River in Madison, Indiana, building a plant halfway between there and Louisville, Kentucky on the river until the uh, people there said, well, uh, this uh, slowed down because of Three Mile Island and the uh, costs are just too much. So we're going to have to cut this plant out. And I, I got transferred then. Uh, I said, well, I'm going to retire from consulting. I'll be an independent contractor. Anytime you guys want to use me, just give me a call. You know where I live. Because I'd, at that time, I'd worked for this company in San Diego for over two years. I'd never been in San Diego <laughs> with them. I was in uh, Richmond, Washington when I hired. So and my daughter was here in Boise. The, uh, Decided if I was going to be commuting, I'd move to Boise because the planes were a lot better out of Boise than out of Richmond, Washington. Wouldn't have to go to Seattle to get a plane every time I wanted to go somewhere. So we decided to move to uh, Boise. And I left my wife for Richland there while I started consulting to get rid of that place there. And when she finally sold it, well, then we just moved to Boise. And that was in what year? That was in 1980 in the summer of 1980, mm -hmm. finally got here. And the, so I, I commuted in, don't fly out of Boise until 1982. And they, working most of the time in uh, Indiana, and made a trip to New Orleans, worked place down there, and I made a trip to Indiana, to Missouri, worked on a plant there and always go back to Indiana, but then I decided to retire, so went home here in Boise. Phone call, uh, why don't you come to New Jersey? <laughs> Plant down at Salem, I wanted to do a, a manager analysis on. So we went to New Jersey, did that, had a three weeks job. And finally on that job, I finally got to go to San Diego for the company, because they, after we did the analysis, we went home, we wrote our reports, sent them into San Diego, San Diego consolidated them, then invited the, the management from the company to San Diego, and we showed up, and we debriefed them, tell them how was wrong with their project, what they're doing wrong, what they should do, and straighten it up. So when did you finally retire from that position? Well, I, I know <laughs> I had a job there, that job, I had another job in Kansas to do, and I went back home again, and they called me one day, up and I said, I don't want to work anymore. This was in 1983, I think it was. I've been doing that for two years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, what have you been doing since then? Uh, well, not since then, I've been having fun. What do you have? What kind of hobbies do you have? I have golf. I used to fish quite a bit and hunt. Um, I have a black lab dog, and she keeps me busy. Because she's a pup, she's only 11 months old now. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I go to, I'm a snowbird. I go to Arizona in the wintertime, Idaho in the summertime. Where in Arizona do you go? Uh, northwest of Phoenix, right on the northwest edge of a town called Surprise. Mm -hmm. And it's a wonderful place. I've been doing that now for 20 years, going there every winter. And when I first went down there first winter, they had about 3,000 people in Surprise. Now they're 55,000 
It's growing like crazy. And do you have any grandchildren? I have three grandchildren and nine great-grandchildren. And the, my grandchildren, all three of them are married with three kids each. And my oldest great-grandson has just joined the Marines. He leaves home in November for boot camp. He graduates from boot camp February 4th on schedule. And I'm going to be there for his graduation. Great. Yeah. Because uh, he wanted to be a Marine. He didn't. Yeah, my oldest grandson is retired Air Force. And he's now a cop in Great Falls, Montana. And uh, the other one, the other, the other grandson is uh, working in a, a company here in Napa. Uh, a supply company furnished the wallboard and stuff. And you said you had three grandchildren? Three grandchildren. Okay. The daughter of the granddaughter. granddaughter. Don't forget the granddaughter. <laughs> no, she's a middle one. And she has three kids of her own. And the well, oldest one is uh, developmentally handicapped. And Does she so live in the area here? They live, they, oh, they live in the Boise area, yes. And uh, to hear two boys, the youngest boys, both of them are just extremely brilliant. One of them is, uh, the oldest one is the, uh, he's going to a charter school somewhere here that you don't take everybody in. You have to pass, be so much above the average to get in there. And when he was in his freshman year at high school, he was designing computer programs. And uh, he's going to have a uh, internship with Micron and probably get a job in Micron and get his uh, college education through Micron. Excellent. That's a great grandson. The oldest great grandson, the one that's going to Marines, he, he was working uh, for the street rock company hanging wallboard, and they were going to put him through college, too. He said he wanted to be a Marine instead. Well, it sounds like you've had a very full life. I've been interesting. And we... Um, and it's been enjoyable. I've, I've enjoyed every moment of it. We can tell yeah. that you've really enjoyed every, you know, your service time mm -hmm. uh, and, and your life afterwards mm -hmm. was uh, very mobile. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. uh, and. Uh, I always like to end the interview uh, with a, a question for you. Uh, what do you feel you gained from your military experience? Uh, a goal in life. Before I joined the Navy, I had no goal. I was going to school. I didn't know what, really what I wanted to do and when I graduated from school. Even I didn't know what I wanted to study, so I just taken general courses. But when I went into Navy, I had a goal then. I would, uh, the war came along, and just, just uh, augmented uh, my goal to achieve in that position in life. Mm -hmm. I decided I was going to make the Navy a career then. Up until the war, I was not going to make it a career. I was going to put my first enlistment in, get it out go to the Colorado School of Mines and be a petroleum engineer. I never made it. But and, and I always ask, too, if you have anything you'd like to say uh, to your family or uh, a, a statement. Uh. Well, my family knows I love them, so I don't have to say that. But, uh, just uh, do the best you can, whatever you do. Don't ever lose sight of the fact that you can do better. Well, we certainly do thank you uh, for your service to the, our country, uh, and we thank you so much for coming in to tell us your story. And we're sure that many generations are going to enjoy watching this. Well, I appreciate you having me. I enjoy talking to you, and it's been a pleasure on my part to fill this in. Thank you.